Welcome to the Chief Architect Kitchen Remodeling Seminar. In this session of the video, we're going to go through the as-built process. I'm going to open up an existing plan. I'm going to remove the walls, expand the ceiling. Next, I'm going to go ahead and do the kitchen design on the main wall, which you see in the background. Then we're going to do the cabinet layout for the refrigeration walls, and then the custom backsplash, you can see. And we're going to place the island and furniture, look at the materials options, and then finally go through the process of exporting the 360 images and the 3D viewer. Let's go ahead and get started. Now I've opened up the as-built condition where the walls exist today and we want to remove these walls and go in and build the kitchen. And through that process of removing the walls I'm going to also go through and expand the ceiling. Let's begin the process by first capturing the as-built condition so we can overlay this and maybe show the clients what it looks like with a before and after process. Now if you're a longtime Chief Architect user, you may go through the process to create an as-built mask by going to your floor plan and taking a screen capture using the CAD detail from view and that's going to capture basically a screen capture of this and you can overlay that in a 2D method. The process I'm going to show you today is from the 3D view, I'm going to actually convert this to a symbol and then I'm going to turn all the walls into a glass house view so I can overlay that into the new structure. In the tools menu you're going to find convert to symbol and I'm going to accept the defaults. I'm going to go ahead and place it in a category. It doesn't really matter underneath the fixtures interior. That process adds it into your library. You can see a preview in the lower right hand corner of my screen of what we just did here. I'm going to go ahead and rename this so that it's something meaningful and then I can overlay this. And I'm going to come back to this at the end of the video so we can overlay it in the space and you can see what it looks like with the walls that existed before we did the demo work. I'm going to go through now and I'm going to actually remove these interior walls. And I'm just going to hold my shift key down and I'm going to select the different walls and then I'm going to press delete when I'm finished here. Now this area back in the far back corner back in here, I'm going to create an alcove so we have a flat ceiling. And to do that, I'm actually going to use a room divider tool so that I can use the room definition to control the ceiling. Let me switch over to the floor plan view. Now I'm going to choose that room divider tool again just for room definition for the ceiling and I'm going to draw a small room divider that just goes across and runs into what will be the pantry eventually. Go ahead and get rid of this room name and I'm going to use the 3D camera tool and let's take a view inside of the room with the ceiling. So let's just point and click in this area directed towards it. You see the space in here with a big flat ceiling and again in the very back wall I want to leave a flat ceiling and then the rest of the space we want to go ahead and raise the ceiling up. If I click on the middle of the floor here which will select the room I'm going to go ahead and double click on it to open up the room properties. On the structure panel inside the room specification I'm going to remove the flat ceiling. I'm also going to mark that it uses a soffit for the ceiling so the underneath of the roof will become the ceiling surface. When we remove the room's ceiling, you can now see the exposed beam in the room. Now the next thing I want to do is make a few changes in here. One is let's go ahead and use the material eyedropper from the floor and apply that onto the ceiling surface. So I'm just going to come down here, use the material eyedropper off of the floor, and I'm going to apply that onto the ceiling. Now the next thing I want to do, I'm going to take these side walls off to the right, and I'm going to make these half walls, and then this area back in here that used to be the closet, I'm actually going to convert that into a pantry, and then we'll make that what's called a shelf ceiling, so that that ceiling and these walls come down from the top. So let's do this in the 2D view. Now in the 2D view, you can see the walls we're talking about. I'm going to use the break wall tool. You'll find that up here in the menu. It's called break wall. I'm going to come down here at this intersection between the closet and this hallway. And you can see a small line that appears in this area right here. Once that's completed, I'm going to go ahead and select both of the walls in here. And I'm going to actually convert these into a railing and specify that they're a half wall. So let's double click and open them up. Under the general panel, I'm going to go ahead and mark that they're a railing. On the rail style, let's go ahead and mark that they're solid. So you can see the preview change. And then under newels and balusters, this is where you set the height. And typical 9 foot ceiling, rough ceiling has 109 and 8. I'll go ahead and put that in as that value of the height there. And then the final change for this wall, there's a new wall cap option beginning in Chief Architect X10. Let's go ahead and add a new profile for the top of this wall. And I'm going to browse out to the library. I'm just looking for a simple profile in here. 
One last thing that I sometimes do for plan clarity is change the wall type so that it looks different in the 2D view. Right now the 2D view this half wall looks exactly like if I slide this dialog over the other wall that's actually a full wall. So what I may do in here is let's go in and make a copy of this wall type and we'll just hit copy and in this case I'll just call it interior for half. And then I'm going to change the fill style in here instead of a solid fill. I'm going to go ahead and use an angle hatch. That way it shows up very differently in my floor plan and it makes it easy to discern what type of wall type I have. Now when we return back to the 3D view, you can now see these half walls with the wall cap on top. The next step is to take this room back here that was the closet and let's make that a shelf ceiling and also change the door style in here. So I'm going to do that back again back in the plan view. To open up the closet, let's select the room, double click, and go into the room information in here. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to change the room type from a closet to a kitchen. And then let's override the name that it's going to be used and let's type in uh, pantry. The reason I'm changing the room type to kitchen is it will automatically change the flooring material. The next thing is, is in the structure component. I'm going to come down here I'm going to mark that it's a shelf ceiling. And I'm also going to change the height of that since it includes the structure and I need to lower that down so that actually the top of this is at the same height as our half wall. So to do that I'm just going to subtract six inches from this number in here and then with that shelf ceiling in here let's go ahead and return back to the 3D view here. Now you can see the shelf ceiling has now reduced and you actually have a room within a room. The next step is let's go ahead and take this door and convert it into a glass door. Under the door style I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to use a glass panel and you can see in the preview what it will look like. That's picking up the defaults that I've set up and now you can easily see into the pantry and it makes a lot of sense to have that glass door since we're going to have the rest of the kitchen off to the side over here. The next step in the video is to make some changes to the windows. You can see now that we've opened up the ceiling We've got space in this gable wall to add additional windows and also up above area for the back wall of the kitchen. I want to go ahead and place some windows in there and again maybe off to this side and above the door. And as I begin, let's go ahead and select. I'm going to hold my shift key down. I'm going to select various windows and I'm going to go ahead and raise these up about 12 inches. So again, holding my shift key down, I'm just going to grab all of the windows that I want and down here in the status bar I should have seven windows selected. Let's go ahead and click the open button and the first thing I want to do is I want to go ahead and change these to be 12 inches higher and before I do that I'm going to note the floor to bottom is 23 and an eighth. On the height, let's go ahead and increase those to 12, 12 inches, which will make them 84. And then let's go ahead and put the floor to bottom back at the 23 and an 8. That's a pretty easy way to increase the height of those windows. The next thing I want to do is I want to add some additional windows in this gable wall. And to do that, I may actually just go back here, take a full overview, and open up the library. Let's take a full overview using the perspective full overview. And then I'm going to go ahead and open up the library. And I've already got some pre-configured windows that I've added and I've blocked added in the library. On the back wall with this gable, let's go ahead and use this uh, rear gable window. And let's come in here and place that and center it over the back of those windows. Again, a lot of times what I'll do is highlight the object, use this center tool down in your lower menu, and come in here and that will center that object. Hold the Alt key and orbit around. And I'm going to go ahead and place the attic windows that will then show up in the kitchen. And you can kind of see where it's going to snap in between areas. Let's go ahead and place our first window there. And we'll grab the attic three window and we'll place that over here. And we can position those more accurately from the plan view in the attic level to be more exact. For the video I'm just placing them in the 3D view. And the final one is to put a transom type window over the top of our entry door. Again, place it off to the side using the center tool in the lower edit menu. You can come in here and then center that on the door. Let's go ahead and wheel, scroll in, and now you can see the way those windows look in this view. And it's going to provide quite a bit of light between that and then also above the, uh, above the door. We have pretty much finished creating the space that we need for the new kitchen by removing the walls and adding the windows. The next thing I want to do is I want to show you now how to overlay the as-built masks that we produced at the beginning of the video. 
And if I come down here, you can see that as-built model down here. And let's go ahead and return to the plan view to go through this process. From the plan view, I'm going to grab the symbol of the as-built and place it right next to our existing plan. When you return back to the 3D view, you're going to see that there isn't much difference between the two as far as looking like an actual floor plan. But the nice thing is we've actually captured the as-built condition before we did any of the demo work. Now the next thing I want to do is I want to change all of the materials in this symbol to be a translucent glass house view. And what I'm going to do is let's just double click on this symbol. And underneath the materials, I'm going to go ahead and select all of the different materials that may exist in that symbol when we exported it. And I'm going to change all of them. Let's grab a glass that is being used in our current plan. And I'm just going to grab one of these. And what that's going to do is it's going to turn every single surface into that glass material. Now, from the floor plan view, let's go ahead and overlay this. We'll grab this symbol, and I'm just going to simply come over here. You could use a point-to-point -point move. And then from within the floor plan, let's go ahead and generate our 3D view. Let's go ahead and grab our full camera, and we'll just point and click in this direction. And you see in the 3D view those existing walls. And what I need to do is actually lower it by the platform height. So let's go ahead and select the object. And I'm going to use the Transform Replicate. And I'm actually just going to move that down. And now you can see exactly the way that's going to look after the changes go into play. Let's zoom in here a little bit below there. And you see those, those walls that show up? And you go back to your floor plan view, you can also see where these walls laid out. You can put this on a layer. You can change the color if you want. And then you can toggle the layer on and off. Let's take an overhead camera view and take a look at it from this perspective. So you can also see where exactly where those walls were. And it's kind of a unique view to be able to show if you're trying to show a client what the difference is between their as-built and their new space. And depending on the view, again, it's easy to see the difference because remember when we began the video, we actually had a flat ceiling in the room before we opened that up and put the windows in there. Now as you move forward and begin placing cabinets, since this is a very large symbol and has occupied the house, oftentimes that's going to conflict, make it a little bit more difficult to do the design work because you may have to hold the control key down. So usually what I'll do is I'll just move this below the floor platform as a temporary basis so it doesn't compete with cabinets or furnishing items. In this segment of the video, I'm going to go through the process of laying out and designing the back wall known as the main wall in the kitchen where the cook range and the cabinets are. From the floor plan view, let's switch our layer set and actually now plan sets to the kitchen and bath view so we can see the space without all the added detail of the floor plan. And then using the floor overview camera, let's go ahead and take a look at what we have. The first step that I want to do in the kitchen layout is actually place the gas range and get that dimensioned and accurately positioned. Let's open up the library and browse in and let's find our gas range. I've got a shortcuts folder with some of my favorite tools in particular for this kitchen. I'm going to grab the gas range and I'm going to come over here and click and place this. And then I'm also going to grab the cook hood. And most of the times I'll use the center tool while that cook hood is selected. Let's go ahead and use the center tool. We'll come over here and center that on the range. Now back in the floor plan view, I'm going to go ahead and zoom in. And there's a small room. Remember we drew a room divider in the previous video to give us room definition to give us a flat ceiling. While this room area is selected, and you can see that in the gray highlight, make sure that your dimension defaults, in this case my dimension defaults are using the NKBA dimension defaults if you're using Chief Architect Premier. When that room is selected, you can place your automatic dimensions. And really the one that I'm most concerned about is the one back here. I'll clean up these and just remove them because they'll be unnecessary. I'll draw a marquee around those two components. And I'm going to go ahead and highlight that dimension. And I'm going to enter in 81 inches. So that accurately positions those two appliances exactly where I need them to be. With the range in the hood exactly positioned, let's begin with the cabinet layout. And I'm going to begin with the base cabinets. And the first one I'm going to place is a corner cabinet. And I'm going to leave that with a diagonal front. You can always change those cabinets from a diagonal front on the general panel. And you can un simply uncheck that box to make it a pie front. In this case, I'm going to leave this as a diagonal cabinet. Let's place one more cabinet adjacent. 
in this area. Notice how it fills the space. And for this cabinet, I want it to be a three drawer bank. Inside of the cabinet dialog, I'm going to click on the face item that's a door and let's change that to be a drawer and I'm going to use the split horizontal to create two different face items out of that. With the cabinet still selected I'm going to use the copy you'll find in the lower edit menu and then reflect about and I'm going to center that over the top of the range and place a cabinet on that side. Next one more cabinet next to the three drawer bank let's go ahead and bump that against the cabinet and then I need a filler that's right in this area, right down in this, between the wall and the cabinet. You'll find that in the build menu under cabinet and base filler. And we'll just come in here and place that filler in here. And then we'll have to slide that back. And I'm probably going to have to go back into the plan view to get that exactly positioned where I need it. So let's just kind of zoom in, select that filler, and we'll bump it back into place. In the 3D view, you can actually see that that filler is now accurately placed. One of the new features, as long as I'm in this view in Chief Architect X10, is one of our new rendering techniques that is physically based. When I switch to that view, you can see that the stainless steel gets a lot better and a much more realistic. Of course, I have no lights in this view, so it looks very dark, but this new rendering technique is going to give you a lot more realistic views. We call it ray trace without the weight and it will give you very realistic views being able to do that. Let's switch that view back to the standard view. And to begin with, with the wall cabinets, let's place the wall filler so we can do that unobstructed before we place the wall cabinets. Underneath the build menu, let's go back in and grab a wall filler. Let's click and place that filler. And the first thing I want to do is I want to set this to be one and a half inches and then we'll bump it against the wall. One and a half matches the lower base filler. So let's just snap that against the wall. And then using the wall cabinet, let's go ahead and place the wall cabinet right against that filler. And then with the temporary dimensions turned on, let's go ahead and resize that to be 42 inches. Now there's a space in between the cook hood and this wall cabinet. I want to maintain that symmetry. Let's go ahead and select the cabinet. Use the copy tool in the lower left edit menu and then reflect that around the range or around the cook hood. I've got my automatic blind corner cabinet turned on by default which is typically the out of the box scenario. Let's just resize that so I can show you how that works as I place one more cabinet on this wall over here. So let's go ahead and pull that cabinet against the wall, resize it to be 36 inches. And then as I bump this other cabinet back to the 42 inches, since that automatic blind cabinet is on, notice that that face item has changed in there to be a blind type cabinet. Now I have a lot of wall space in here for these cabinets. Remember I have a flat ceiling that will be just above this alcove area. And what I want to do is make a couple of changes to these cabinets. First of all, I'm going to make them quite a bit larger. And then I'm going to add another face item at the top of this cabinet. Let's go ahead and grab this door and I'm going to split it horizontally and then for the upper face item let's go ahead and change that item height to be 15 inches. The upper face item I also want to be glass doors and since both of these doors are exactly the same if I apply glass it will apply glass to both of them. In this case I don't want that on the lower door and what I need to do is make two different door styles. While that upper face item that's 15 inches is selected, I'm going to use the specify appliance door and drawer. I'm going to browse out to my library and just choose the same door style, but it will be different when I apply glass to it. So let me browse out to the library and using the exact same door, you'll see that it, the preview in here will make that change. So I can now change that to be a glass component. Now the next thing I want to do in here is add a couple of moldings. One is the crown molding on the molding panel. Let's go ahead and click the add new button. Again, browse out and I'm just going to find a simple rectangular shape molding. And in this case, let's go ahead and set that to be two and five eighths inches. And then we'll go ahead and leave the width at five eighths. And for a vertical offset, if you zoom in here, a negative value will move it up off of the box. So let's go ahead and put in the same value and you'll see that in the preview. The next component is for the light rail. So let's go ahead and click the add new one more time. We'll just grab the exact same molding profile. And in this case, let's set the height to be one and a half inches and the width to be a half inch. And then let's go ahead and change this from the bottom. You can again see this down here. And for the vertical offset, a negative number 
moves it off the box, press the tab key to preview it, and then in the horizontal offset we'll want to make sure that that is set to be a uh, minus half inch. Go ahead and close the dialog, and now the next thing I'm going to do is just use material eyedropper, and we'll apply that paint color onto the different components. Notice I'm in component mode. So now that I've got that upper door style in here, let's go ahead and use the eyedropper off of the glass on the pantry door. And while in this component mode, I can actually change that to that glass style. Go ahead and pull this up to be the 51 inches. And I'm going to come back and assign that molding on here. And in fact, you'll notice that none of the other cabinets have the molding or the same shape. And if I would have selected all three cabinets at the same time, I could have made that change simultaneously, but I didn't. So there's a tool that I like to use called the Object Eyedropper. And this allows me to click on an object that I like. Notice my icon changed to a spray can. And then I'm going to go down into the scoping panel. You'll find this when this is active in the lower left hand section of your menu. And let's go ahead and select the properties that we want to apply. In this case let's clear all of them since I don't want to change my blind corner cabinet to be a uh, cabinet like we're looking at. And what I want to do in this case is go through and I want to select a few things. One, I want to copy the faces of the cabinet. I want to copy the height of the cabinet. So I'm looking for the height and sometimes it's easier to just type in what you're after since it's a pretty long list, in this case molding. And now that I've got all three of those things loaded into the Select Properties to Load tool, now I can apply that to other cabinets. When I do that, I'm going to actually lose my blind corner over here, but as soon as I apply that and then pull it back, you can see that that blind cabinet will then regenerate and be appropriate. So this is a quick way to transfer your properties from one object to another object. Now to apply it to the filler, I'm actually going to regenerate the scoping because the only thing I want in this case is actually the molding. So let's go ahead and unselect the faces and the height and apply that just for the molding. It will then generate that light rail and crown molding for the final step with this wall in the 3D view is to go ahead and apply our backsplash and to do that Let's use the backsplash tool and I'm going to click on the back wall and then also on the side wall and that will generate the backsplash automatically. Let's go ahead and pull this up to the top of the ceiling and now I have that custom backsplash you can see in that view. Let's return back to the floor plan view and then I'm going to go ahead and use the section camera to generate the elevation dimensions. So back in the floor plan view I might just clean up these existing dimensions that were automatically generated. You'll find a couple of cameras. One is a wall elevation view and if I come in here and generate a wall elevation it's going to show you that wall. But in this case where we have a very high ceiling it's not generating that because that's technically outside of the... In that case I'm going to use the back clip cross section camera so I can come outside of that area and then you'll be able to see the windows and the other objects in this view. Let's go ahead and zoom in. There are two different ways to dimension this wall elevation. We have an automatic dimension tool for elevations called the NKBA Auto Dimension Tool. And that's a very busy set of dimensions because it's a complicated elevation view. You can click on these dimensions and remove the different marks, but there's so many of them in here. I think it's easier to manually dimension this when I get into doing the refrigerator wall, it will work much better because it's a very simple wall. Let's go ahead and head undo a couple times. And I find it easier to actually just use the manual tools to dimension this. Let's begin with the dimension tool for end-to-end -end dimensions. Let's go ahead and draw a dimension line that goes up to the top. And we'll do the same thing on the bottom. And then one more between this area and then we'll just go ahead and pull these over and make adjustments. So let's go ahead and pull these down, make room for our center lines. And in this case, it looks like I snapped to the subfloor. Again, that's because we took a section view. And we'll pull this one up. That's using the end-to-end -end dimension tool. Now I'm going to change my tool back to the manual dimension. And instead of using the ruler tool with the dimension defaults, I'm going to switch this to cabinet boxes. What that's going to do in my dimension defaults, double click on that tool or go in and look at what it's going to locate. For objects, 
The one change in here is it's only going to be looking at the cabinet sides, the countertop, and the openings and casing. Let's go ahead and uncheck the casing. In this case, I don't want that to be used. Now I can use that tool, and it's going to be a lot quicker to come through here and pick up just those boxes. Go ahead and slide that into place, and let's do the same thing on the bottom. We'll just drag that dimension through here, and then we can position it down below the boxes. And then one more through this area up here. So we'll pull that down, get that dimension, and slide it over as well. A little bit of cleanup required on here. Again, it goes down to the subfloor. Let's go ahead and pull those around. If you want the countertop, the backsplash. If you want to pick up the light rail, it looks like I missed that. Let's go ahead and drag that extra dimension on there. Come down and it picked up the ceiling platform. Let's go ahead and pull that off. So the first thing is, let's go ahead and highlight the dimension. And if you zoom in, there's a little bit of a move handle in here. And we can actually pull these on and off. Let's go ahead and pull that off. Let's go ahead and pull this one off as well. And I want to actually add it back on for that crown molding. But that little move handle, you have to zoom in to see it. If we come down in here, let's slide the wall height off a little bit. Again, a lot of times I like to clean this up and just kind of move these around. The next dimension is for the center line. Let's switch our tool to the center line. And I've actually created a dimension default to make that quick using the appliance center lines. Let's take a look at what the defaults are set for that tool. If you look at the locate objects, notice that the cabinet sides are not selected. And really the only thing that should be selected in this case is the centers for appliances and fixtures. It's a purpose-built tool that I've created with a new dimension default. With center line selected, let's go ahead and drag that through our range. And there's the 81 inches that we used at the beginning of the video to place that. And we'll just pull that into place. And if you click on the end of the extension, a lot of times I like to pull that up into that position. You could do the same thing on the upper for the cook hood, but since that's exactly centered on the range, I'll avoid that step. So creating those dimensions are pretty easy. The next thing sometimes I like to do is I have a glass indicator. I've saved that off in my library. And one of the things that I've done in my favorites area, let's go ahead and scroll down a little bit. I save off one of those in my CAD blocks. And all it is is a series of three lines and allows me to easily differentiate when I've got glass in the design. And I'll just place a few of those items on there for clarity to make sure that people know that I have glass in those upper wall cabinets. So that's the process of dimensioning the wall elevation. This is a very um, large wall, so the automatic tool creates more of a cleanup effort than I prefer to do. So using the manual tool is very pretty quick. And if you want to learn more about building dimension defaults, you can take a look at uh, some additional videos in the kitchen and bath playlist. Maybe one final detail that I like to do in my floor plans. I choose this camera here. Notice that it has S1 on it. For my plans, I'm going to go ahead and give this a, a different name, maybe main wall. And then on my plan display, give it um, something that's meaningful for my callouts. In this case, I'm going to call it K1. And then you can control how that looks. When you close that elevation view, you'll see the fill come back in and you can control that. That's a call out label from that camera and you can customize it with arrows and various other things. Well, that wraps up this segment of the video. The next step will be to design the next wall for the refrigeration and um, I'll move on and begin that process. In this next section of the video, I'm going to take a look at building the wall for the refrigeration for the wine cabinet, the refrigerator, and then I'll also have a microwave. Notice a few things in this view. The center wall cabinet is actually standing out and sitting on top of the countertop, and then the cabinet drawer is, is open as well. Kind of a minor thing, but in this watercolor view, you can kind of see what we're going to do. Well, the first thing I'm going to do for the refrigeration wall is I'm going to use the partition tool and place that against the wall. I'm going to grab the partition, click, place it. My default is 105 inches. It's also set up to be one and a half inches in thickness. Let's go ahead and bump that against the wall. Again, I'm going to come in at the end and place the moldings on here. In the library, let's go ahead and open that and let's place both the wine refrigerator and our regular refrigerator. And with the refrigerator, let's go ahead and place that. We'll bump that against that partition. 
and then let's grab the uh, wine refrigerator and we'll just place that kind of in this area right in here. Now with the refrigerator, let's make sure that we bump this accurately. So let's go ahead and slide it, bump it against the partition. With that selected or bumped, with the partition selected, use the copy reflect, which I use quite a bit. And let's see if we can ro rotate that around the refrigerator and get that positioned. We'll go ahead and now bump that wine refrigerator. And with that wine refrigerator, I'd prefer the door open on the other side. If I open up the refrigerator, on the general panel is an option to reverse the symbol. Notice how it flips the door to the other side and you can control those symbols in that method. The next thing I want to do is place a wall filler against this wall again unobstructed so I can do that in this view. Underneath the build menu, let's go into the filler and I'm going to place the wall filler. Again, we'll just kind of set that to be an inch and a half in the uh, width 1.5 and then I'm going to go ahead and bump that against the wall and this first cabinet that I place is going to be very similar to the other cabinets that we placed earlier so I'm going to rotate my view around slightly and I'm just going to grab a copy of this press control C on my keyboard and come over here and paste it into place and again we'll slide it over and make sure that it bumps appropriately and let's go ahead and grab that filler as long as we're in here and let's set the height of that to be the same height at 51 inches. Again, I'll come back and deal with the moldings at the very end. Now for the next cabinet, I want to make this extend down to the base cabinet. So let's go ahead and place a wall cabinet in here and I'll bump that against the partition and we'll stretch it against the other cabinet that should make it about 36 inches and we'll resize that one to 51 inches at that top and if we pull this down actually I want to make it 69 inches let's go ahead and open up the cabinet and make a few changes in here on the height let's go ahead and set that to be 69 inches the width is 32 that's fine and then the floor to bottom let's make sure that that is 36 so it sits on top of the countertop and then on the depth I'm going to set it to be 15 inches on the door style Let's go ahead and click on that. I'm going to hit the split horizontal and on this top section what I want to do is hit split one more time. On this upper section on my other doors are 15 inches so we'll mat match that and on this face item in here I'm actually going to delete that and make it an opening. I don't want that shelf in here so I'm going to come over and hit the specify option manual shelves and I'm going to remove that by putting a zero in there. And then I want to make sure that this lower face item is exactly 36 inches. So the most important face item is 36 inches and the upper one at 15 inches will match the other cabinet. Now one change that I do need to make in here, I noticed that that was 30 inches and we copied the 42 inch cabinet. I'm going to resize this to be 36 and I'm going to grab this one and resize it to be 36. Again, we'll come back in and worry about that molding on top of that cabinet in a minute using the object eyedropper. The final cabinet for the area will be above the refrigerator. Let's go ahead and place that. We'll go ahead and resize that. We'll bump it to the partition in this case and bump it to the other side. Probably what I need to do is slide that into place so we can get that to be exactly 36. Let's open up the cabinet, make some changes in here. Again, what I want to do is We'll set the height of this to be 21 inches. We'll set the width of it to be 48. The depth of it at the refrigerator depth 24. And then the floor to bottom, I'm going to make sure that that is 84 inches. The last step for these wall cabinets is to grab the molding and set it on the other cabinets using the object eyedropper. Let's pick up the cabinet we want. You'll notice the scoping tool is activated in the lower menu. And what I want to do is only copy the molding so let's type in molding and I'm going to grab the moldings that are on there and now I'm going to be in this mode where I can click on these components and make the changes so I'm going to grab the partitions and the cabinets and then when I'm finished it should generate all of those moldings now notice this molding on the light rail came down into the refrigerator and it's also going to be down below the countertop so I'm going to hold the shift key down, grab both of those cabinets, and I'm going to remove the light rail off of those. So on the moldings component, we'll go to that second molding down here and just hit the delete key and remove that off. Notice the preview updates. And that's an easy way to apply your moldings or different components from other cabinets.
Now the next step is to place the base cabinets. Let's go ahead and begin with placing our filler off to the right hand side. Again under the build menu you'll find a cabinet filler for the base. I'll click and place that out here in the middle. Let's go ahead and set that to be an inch and a half in width, 1.5 there. And we'll slide that against the wall. Go ahead and bump it. And then using the base cabinet tool, let's place our base cabinet over here. In this case, I want to make sure that this is a 36 inch or 30 inch cabinet. So we'll use our temporary dimensions and make sure that that comes into play. And then the final cabinet between the wine refrigerator and that base cabinet, let's go ahead and place that in here. And I want to set this to be a three drawer bank again. The easiest way to typically do that is to change that face item to a drawer. Use the split horizontal. If you want all of those to be equalized, there is an equalize button in here as well. And now the next step is to place a microwave inside the cabinet on the right. I know you're probably worried about this not having a countertop, and I will get to that as soon as I finish the microwave. In this cabinet, let's go ahead and open it up. And on this face item for the drawer, I'm going to change that to an appliance in the item type. And in the item type, first of all, you can notice when I deselect it, it creates an opening in here. When that appliance section is highlighted, I'm going to browse out to the library and I'm going to insert the appliance. Again, I've saved this off in my favorites folder in my appliances. Let's go ahead and grab the uh, specific appliance from Gen Air that I'm going to use. Now you're going to notice that that microwave will fill the space. So it's important to make sure that you use the dimensions for this appliance from the cut sheet or the spec sheet from that manufacturer. In this case, I'm going to put in 19 and a half. I like to use the finish dimension so it fills that space. And then the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take this separation that's right below that. I'm going to change it to a blank area and I might make that exactly one inch so I have that space. And then the final thing is to change the door to a drawer. And that should be the changes needed for that particular cabinet. Next, let's go ahead and use the custom backsplash tool. We'll click on the wall. It will fill that space with the backsplash. And now for the countertop over the top of the wine refrigerator, the easiest way to do that is to allow the program to help you. So I'm going to grab the cabinet for the microwave. While it's highlighted in the lower edit menu, notice the uh, magic wand over the uh, countertop. It's called Generate a Custom Countertop. Once you click that, it will basically isolate the countertop and allow you to now stretch that, which I'm going to grab this move handle and I'm just going to pull it over and snap it over the top of the wine refrigerator. That's one continuous countertop, probably the way it would be fabricated and installed. And a very easy way to make that custom countertop. A final step in the video, let's return back, do a wall elevation and get our dimensions taken care of. So I'm going to return back to the floor plan view. I'm going to use the wall elevation tool. Again, we previously used the back clip section because that was a very high wall with windows above it. In this case, I'm just going to use the wall elevation tool to click and drag through the wall, and that's going to isolate it to the wall. Notice that I do have a portion of the pantry because that's at a 45 or so degree angle coming into that. Now, the automatic dimension tool should work quite well on this particular wall since it's fairly simple. I'm going to make sure my dimension defaults are set to the NKBA. I'm using Chief Architect Premier for the video, so I do want to make sure those are changed. If you're using Chief Architect Interiors, you will typically always have this set as your default. Um, just make sure that it is because if you get a very distorted looking set of dimensions, your defaults probably aren't set up to be correct. Once I click that tool, I'll probably have to do a little bit of cleanup which should be fairly easy. Let's just kind of begin at the top here. I'm going to remove the center line and we'll pull this one down. We'll zoom in a little bit and I usually kind of just work my way around. It picked up the casing from that pantry door. Notice the move handles in here if you want to use this and pull it around. I'm going to kind of skip that on the other dimensions. We'll come over to the side over here. It's picked up the light rail, the backsplash, the countertop. If we come over to the other side I probably don't need it picking up the countertops or the uh, cabinet itself, so we'll pull that off. And a little bit of cleanup in here. Again, let's go ahead and pull some of these dimensions off that we don't need. 
Now the way that wall elevation cut through there, I'm going to have to zoom in to be able to find some of these move handles. And we'll just pull some of those off that we don't need off of the casing. There's the crown molding. Again, if you want to move those dimensions around, you can. And for the outside dimension, we'll go ahead and pull that off the casing as well. And then on the bottom set of dimensions, let's take a look. Bottom string looks okay. Did pick up this wall cabinet that's touching the countertop. We'll pull that off. On the second dimension line, sometimes what I like to do, again, pull these center lines up into the fixture itself. Again, that's a style choice that you want. That looks pretty reasonably well on the bottom. And as much as I need, again, I might put the glass indicators, maybe put some call-out notes in here and clean it up a little bit. And as I open up the completed wall elevation, uh, I put some text in the opening, also some cookbooks, spice rack, put my glass indicators on here, and this is the way the final wall elevation looks for this particular one. As I return back to the 3D overview, you can kind of see our space as it's evolved. We finished up both the refrigeration wall and our main wall. In the next segment, I'm going to show you how to place the kitchen island. I'm not going to go through all of the steps in building that. I'm going to show you the process that I use after I blocked it, added it to the library. You can easily place them in other plans, unblock them, and customize the islands. Pretty quick way to save some of your islands off. And I'll address that in the next segment of the video. In this next segment of the video, I'm going to show you a few of the items to kind of jazz up the kitchen. One, I'm going to show you the process to customize the backsplash. Next, I'm going to show you the process of placing the island from an existing island block in the library. And then I'll place some other furniture groupings. I'm going to begin actually with customizing the backsplash a little bit. Take a look at my completed rendering. The backsplash, I felt like I wanted to put a little bit of more detail in there. I'm going to take a open up that wall elevation that we did earlier in the video. I'm going to show you the process of how to create this. In the elevation view, I'm going to use the line tool and I'm going to draw a line from the top of the cook hood down to the countertop. Sometimes I hold the control key down to give myself a little bit of added flexibility. And once I've finished that, I'm going to click on that line and using the break tool in my lower edit menu, it's also number three on the keyboard. I'm just going to click a point at the midpoint of that line. And on this lower segment, I'm going to curve it this way. And on the upper segment, I'm going to curve it the same way. And on the lower segment, let's go ahead and reverse the curve a little bit. And you can spend some time. You can open those up and get the exact radius. While it's selected, let's use the copy and reflect tool around the range or the cook hood. Zoom out a little bit. And so that's now symmetrical. And I'm going to use this top diamond. And let's just pull that over until it connects to the other one. And we'll pull this one over. And what's going to happen in that case is it's going to close a, those lines. They're called polylines. And once it's finished, let's use this tool down in the Edit menu called Convert to a Polyline. And in this case, you can convert it to a solid. And then we can define what the thickness is. I think our backsplash is probably in the half inch range. I want to make sure that it stands out. Let's just set it at three quarters of an inch to begin with. And we can come back and adjust that. Now that that's set, I'm going to use the material eyedropper, pick up the countertop so it shows up as a different material. And then we'll finalize that material once we place the island. Now the process of placing the kitchen island, we saw how we placed the main wall and the refrigeration wall. Again, it's basically an assignment and grouping of cabinets. You can spend quite a bit of time on those waterfalls, different shapes of countertops. What I like to do after I've designed the island is block them and add them into my library. And if I open up my library, let's go ahead and uh, browse down to my favorites folder where I have a bunch of different islands. And I'm going to highlight the island that I like to use for this particular plan. This is going to be easiest to place it in the plan view. So I return back to the plan view. I'm going to grab that island. Let's kind of hold the middle mouse button down. We'll click and place the island and then position it where we want to. And I'm just going to kind of approximately position it. I have a mark down in here that I use to position it. That's going to be close enough. You go back to the 3D view. And now you see the island. And notice in the blocking that I had with the island, not only does it have the cabinets, but it also has the accessories. It has the lights. It has the chairs. I 
built a custom strainer that I put in here, the cutting board, the fixtures, all of those components can be blocked and saved to your library. And it's a great way to build up a collection of these because a lot of times maybe you have an idea for one island, you can easily click on these, you can unblock them, and then you can customize the individual components that you need to. And in this case, if I just wanted to grab this cabinet now and resize it, it's very easy to customize it and make it look as I need to for various projects. Now the next thing I want to do is let's take a look at adding the rest of the accessories. I like to do my designs. If I open up one of those renderings that I have of this, I like to have different accessories in the design and a lot of times I'll just create these and save them into the library. Then it's easy to pull these out. I can even block the entire setting in there. If we close this view, and again this is easiest to do from your plan view, I'm going to go into my library and in this case I've created a accessories folder for this particular project and here are my kitchen accessories. I'm going to go ahead and come out here, maybe zoom out a little bit to place that and I'll click and place it. I don't see them show up so I'm going to change my plan view to my interior accessories layer and now I can highlight that. I can kind of position it where I need to. Looks like I'll probably need to rotate it around. I'll use this rotation handle to rotate it around and then we'll just kind of slide it into place where I think that should be. And then when you go back into the 3D view, let's take a look. You can see those accessories have been placed. Those are all individual components found in the library and all I did was block them. You can find those at our 3D library. You can also export external objects from a variety of sources as long as they're a 3DS type file or there are several other types of files that you can import into the program couple more libraries that maybe I'll place. Let's go back to the plan view and what I have done is for my furniture if you come in and let's take a look at placing maybe our uh, living furniture we'll come over here off to the side place the living furniture again I want to position that where I need to be and what I'll do is rotate that around using the rotate handle and then we'll pull that over into place and then maybe one more against the back wall. Let's go ahead and grab the back wall that I've created with the fireplace and all the cabinets. So let's again come over here. Sometimes I'll have to place this outside of the room and then we can position that into place since it's so large and we'll just kind of get it in close and then we'll go back into the 3D view and just rotate around and you can see all of those components that we easily blocked and added from the library. Again those are individual components. These are just base cabinets for the entertainment or living space back here. I blocked them together. In fact I even blocked it with an entire fireplace, TV and accessories. It's a very fast way to make those changes. Now in this final segment of the video I want to show you how to create different options or different color combinations and choose your materials and textures. And as we created that custom backsplash, one of the first things I want to do is make sure that I match it off of that countertop. And what I've done for this segment of the video, I've created a few different uh, renderings of the same scene. And it's pretty easy to do if you want to show different options for the clients. Here is uh, the red version, blue version, and then the white version and I've basically saved off the different paint codes into my library to do that and then the other one is more of the watercolor version that somewhat takes away the aspect of the particular color selection depending on the client you have. Let's go through and regenerate our 3D view so you can see the uh, ceiling and I'll close this and let's go back in. To generate that view let's use the full camera and I'm just going to kind of come back here in the corner and point and click toward the direction of the kitchen scene. And as this generates, what I want to do in this case is let's open up our library and I'm going to show you what I've done to save my materials and textures. In this particular client file, what I've done is in my material selections, I actually have three different colors to apply. When I select the first color, notice that my paint can is ready to spray. In the spray mode, it's going to paint solid body and when you change that to the paint roller mode, as you see my paint roller mode, it changes to a stain mode. So first of all I'm going to make sure it's in this paint mode and then I'm going to change the scoping on for the entire plan, which means any of the colors that I spray on it will change it for the entire plan. Very powerful tool, very dangerous tool because if I have white cabinets or if the white on this 
casing back here on the pantry door is using the exact same color, it's going to paint it that, that color. And I want to avoid that. So what I've done is I've applied these three colors only to the cabinets. And so when I apply the paint to the cabinets, it only does it in the mode of changing it for those particular colors. And let's rotate around a little bit here. Again, if I select the red color now in this plan mode, it will quickly change those to the red. And it gives you a quick way to then render that project out and save your options. Let's go back to the white and we'll swap that out and change it to the white. By the way, one of the tips that I always do when I'm in this mode is I always, when I'm finished, change this back to object or component mode so I don't accidentally paint something in another room that may not be obvious. Once you have those scenes set up, you can render it, save them off as I've done in this case. I've saved off all three of those and you can then send them to your client so that they can then visualize them. And here's the watercolor scene. So being able to generate these different render techniques, if I were to change this, let's go ahead and change this to the vector view. You can just kind of toggle through and get the different types of views you want. If I want to toggle off the shadow, you see how my shadow's in here. What I might do is go into this camera and turn off shadows in this case. There's reflections you can turn on, bloom you can turn on, and you can control exactly the way it's going to look. I also like using the technical illustration view. It's kind of a nice monochromatic view. There's a line drawing view that is also pretty nice to use. And these are all different filters that you can change and set up your views. Now a couple of points about rendering that have changed in X10. One is I can actually control all of my lighting. And if you're going to use the new physically based rendering, you're going to need to make sure you have lights on. And in X10, you can actually turn more than eight lights on in these render views. So let's take a look at our lighting first. And for the physical based rendering, you actually have to have lights on or it's, the scene's going to look dark. So let's go in and adjust our lights in this standard view. And right now my lighting is automatic. And I'm going to change it to a lighting set. And the first thing you're going to notice is in the background it got very bright because I've turned on a lot of lights and they're very, very bright in this case. The other thing I can do is I can actually control, if you scroll down, these are all the lights that I have on. So there must be 50 or more lights in here. So they're all turned on and it's a very bright scene. And if I switch this rendering technique now to the physical based, it does take a minute to, to do it, but it's nothing like the amount of time that it might take for ray tracing. And if I rotate around here a little bit, let's zoom in a little bit. And as I rotate around, you can actually see the, a lot of the reflections if I get it just right from the lights. And it's a lot more realistic view that you can get using this particular style. Notice the stainless steel that we have in here. And you can record a walkthrough with this style as well. So it allows you to get a much more realistic view. But the key to this is making sure that you have all of your lights set in. And sometimes the match between the standard view and this render view may look a little bit different and you have to play with the lighting sets. Now to save these renderings out, if you want to go into your menu to export, a couple things. One is you can export as a regular flat image that we have on the screen here choose your file type. The other is you can also export this out as a 360 panorama image. When you choose that option, you can specify the size, save it to your local disk. They look a little strange since there are six images stitched together. And the other option is to save it up to your cloud account on your chief architect cloud. Let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to simulate that and then I'm going to switch over to my cloud account. In my account, there is a link to the 360 panoramas that you push up to the cloud. And what I've done is I've actually done a ray trace of that kitchen. And if we click view on that, you can see the preview of the 360 and you can actually then navigate around and the 360 image, the key to these, is you want to kind of position yourself in the middle of that room and then you can kind of move around as you need to. The nice thing about these, when you put them on the cloud account, let's go ahead and make this one public. When I make it public, what I can do when I do that is I can actually click the share button. You can email it to somebody. They can view it directly with a direct link. 
or you can also embed it on your website. You can grab this code here that is generated and it will embed it in the website. What's happening behind the scenes there is we have a viewer that stitches these 360 renderings together. And if you didn't have our viewer, this is kind of what that image looks like. It looks a little crazy because again, these are four images across, two images high, and with our viewer, we basically map that as a sphere, and that's what the 360 viewer does. There's an option to view these in the VR goggles, so if you want to put your phone in the set of the VR goggles, you can then put those in the headset and you can look around. So it's a nice option. You can again embed this on your website and show off your portfolio. The last option that I want to show, you can export this as an entire 3D viewer model. And it gives the clients the same navigation tools that you have in Chief Architect. The 360 images, while they're pretty cool, until you know that you can't move your feet, you don't have the same navigation tools. So if you want to export this and give it to your clients, you'll find that option down here in the export. And you can give it a name. You can also export any saved cameras that you may have. So I have several of those. And if I were to include all of those, you can figure out which one you want as your initial view. You can then send it out to the client. Go ahead and simulate what's going to happen here. And I'll go out to my account with this export. And then once it comes up, it takes a minute. We'll go back into my account and we can take a look at it. So much like the 360 images in your cloud account, there's a link for your 3D viewer models. Here's the model that I exported. Again, if you want to make that private or share it, which I've just clicked, and then the share button again, if you want to send a direct link, the email, or embed it on your website, you can do that. Let's hit the view button on this one. So in this case, I'm going to view it in the web, and we have a specific viewer that you can download from the App Store on Google or on the App Store in iTunes, and then these work with your tablets and uh, and phones. And you have a, quite a few more controls to do that. The first thing I'm going to do is let's switch this over to the high def mode. You need to make sure that your uh, your device has enough memory to do that. And now in this mode. Again, I'm just in a web browser. You can kind of navigate around those cameras that we saved. If I want to help with the navigation, we can just click on these cameras and it will take you immediately to that component. Now, these thumbstick controls allow you to navigate right and left. They work really nice on the different tablets. So if you want to navigate around, move forward, it makes it very a very easy process. You can also use the keyboard to navigate around. These models, if you click on the different cameras, you can save different views. See, in this case, I've opened up the cabinets and just assist with the different navigation views of this. But it's a great way to interact with your client, get them excited about the process of the project. Well, that wraps up the end of the kitchen remodeling seminar. Hope you enjoyed it. Kind of a recap on a few of the things we did. One is we started with the as-built. I converted that as-built to a symbol and then I overlaid it, changed the materials to glass house. Kind of a nice way to show the as-built. We went through the design process on the back kitchen main wall. Key to that was using the back clipped cross-section camera since it's a very high wall. The refrigeration wall was pretty simple with the different uh, automatic elevation and dimension tools. Custom backsplash, we place the island out of the library. Again, it's very a nice option to save your portfolio and different components into the library, whether it's the island or the furniture. We took a look at a few of the material options with the red, white, and blue. And then finally, how to export your 360 images and your 3D viewer models. Hope you enjoyed the video. We have several others on the website. Take a look and uh, thanks for watching.